well today we're going to complete a series of messages that I started some time ago called life is like a roller coaster and uh, over the last few weeks and uh, actually a couple of months now we have discovered that life really is kind of like a roller coaster the unexpected ups and downs the the turns that come when we least expect it those moments when we are plunged into absolute darkness and in the course of our time together when we've looked at those challenges that that seem to come from nowhere, we have found an answer to those in God's Word by looking at the book of Psalms. Now, the reason that we've looked at Psalms as an answer to each one of the challenges that we've discussed is because Psalms is such a raw and honest book. Um, I mean, it gives us the story of, of so many people and the challenges they face, and it doesn't clear coat it or make it good. I mean, it, it just gives us the raw truth and the challenges that are there and certainly we're going to discover that today when we look at the life of David and discover one of the darkest times in David's life and to recognize that God made certain that even though the Bible calls David a man after God's own heart God made sure that recorded in Scripture are some of the most horrendous mistakes a person can make and they're made by David and God keeps that in the Bible and what an encouragement for us. Because if David can do the kind of stuff he did and still somehow come to the place where God refers to him as a man after my own heart, then I think there's hope for me and there's hope for you. And so in our time together today, we're going to look at uh, a passage of Scripture that speaks to David and, and really speaks to us in a common, uh, I, I think, a common event that every one of us face in the roller coaster of life. You know, what I've discovered is that sometimes the dark experience that we find ourselves in are the result of our own doing. Uh, some of the challenges that we face in life are nobody else's fault. They're our own fault. And that's the case in David's life. Often the consequences for what we do and, and, and our actions produce something even greater that we have to struggle with than the consequences of our action and that is the guilt that we feel from our actions and we carry that guilt with us and often as a result of that we are depressed or we are stressed or we are angry or we become despondent and defeated and there are some of you that are here today and you have carried with you guilt over actions that happened years ago and you've never let go of it and for many of you the, the guilt that you feel over the actions of your behavior continue to define you today now let me help you understand something guilt is a horrible thing if you are not guilty okay and there are some of you that are feeling guilt today over things you're not guilty of I, I mean the Bible calls Satan the accuser it's a good word for him because Satan accuses us of things that we're not guilty of things that we have done for, for which we have gone to God and asked God for forgiveness and God has forgiven us but Satan comes to say no he hasn't not really do you think God would forgive you of that come on be reasonable now God might forgive other people but not you you know you know better and he accuses us and often we listen to the voice of the accuser and that guilt haunts us every day there are other times though that we're guilty and guilt is a good thing if I'm guilty someone said that one of the problems in America today is that we have forgotten how to blush. One of the things that's wrong in our world today is that we're no longer feeling guilty about things that we do that are wrong. We justify our actions. Listen, guilt is a good thing if you are guilty because it can bring us to a place of repentance and forgiveness. Well, there was an event in David's life where he made a decision choose his way over God's way and the result haunted him day and night 
It's a story you're perhaps very familiar with in the story of David's sin uh, as he committed adultery with Bathsheba. Now, we're familiar with this story, but what you might not know is that after that experience where, where, where David was, was about to be caught in his sin, he committed adultery with a woman, she became pregnant with his child, and you remember, he, he contrived a plan to have her husband killed, literally had her husband murdered to cover his sin, and he thought everything was fine, but it wasn't fine in his own heart. And in Psalm 31, we're not going to look at that, but it's interesting, in Psalm 31, this is what David said. He said, man, I just, I couldn't sleep at night because of the weight of the guilt of what I'd done continued before me. My life was like a desert, starving for water, and I had none. I, I just was empty on the inside. I was tormented. And some of you can identify with that and understand. Well, about a year later, David kind of thought everybody had forgotten it, even though he hadn't, even though he was dealing with it personally. Nobody else knew about it, but it was haunting him. He was confronted with that sin. And God brought it back to his attention through Nathan, who told him a story. And David was, uh, was a king, and so the, the, the Nathan comes along and says, Hey, king, there's a guy in your kingdom who uh, had some friends coming over and family members coming. And he was a wealthy man, and he had all kinds of sheep and herds and but, but he had some friends coming in, and he needed to feed them. And so instead of going to his flock and taking of what he had, he went to a poor man's house that lived next door to him. He took his only land, the only sheep he had, a ewe. He took that sheep, and he killed it, and he slaughtered it, and he offered it as food to his family. And David was infuriated. What kind of man would do that? That is just ridiculous that he would do that. Who is that man? David got so mad that he was going to deal with him as a king. I'm not going to let somebody in my kingdom buy all that. And so he ultimately said, well, who is? You just tell me who it is, Nathan. And Nathan said, you are the man, David. You did that. That's exactly what you did. Your sin has come before God. And it brought David face to face with his sin. And he did something that many of us have never learned to do. He dealt with it. And in Psalm 51... We have the record of David in his own journal processing his sin. And as he does that, he gives to us five steps that we can take to find forgiveness in our own life. And the greatest need many of you have is forgiveness. To come to the place where you recognize that you can let go and God can literally forgive you of things that have happened in your past. And the dark despair that many of you face on the roller coaster of life are the result of decisions you have made, sins that you have committed, that have brought you to a place where you think there is no hope that I could ever be restored with others and with God. But in Psalm 51, we find encouragement. Turn with me, if you will, in the Bible to Psalm 51. And we're going to look at those five things together that David does. And I've listed them there in your listening guide. You'll want to kind of follow along as you uh, are, are look at those words and, and follow along in the text. And kind of see if you can identify those five steps that David takes to find this forgiveness. Begin with verse 1, chapter 51. David says this, Be gracious to me, O God, according to your loving kindness. According to the greatness of your compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgression and my sin is ever before me against you. And you only I have sinned. And I've done what is evil in your sight. So that you are justified when you speak and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the innermost being, in the hidden part. You will make me <clears throat> no wisdom. Purify me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness. Let the bones which have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence. Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain me with a, loving, with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will be converted to you. Deliver me from blood guiltness, O God, the God of my salvation. 
Then my tongue will joyfully sing of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, that my mouth may declare your praise. For you do not delight in sacrifices, otherwise I would give it. You are not pleased with burnt offerings. The sacrifice of God or a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O God, you will not despise. By your favor, do good to Zion, build the walls of Jerusalem, then... You will delight in righteous sacrifices and burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings and the young bulls will be offered on your altar. As David just kind of reflects upon this most solemn moment in his life, as he's confronted almost a year after the event, hopeful that, that, that by now I can begin to, to, to forget, I can begin to go on, the nightmares will cease. Suddenly, the deepest, darkest secret of his life is exposed. And in that moment, he does what many people do not do. He comes to God. And five steps that he takes literally bring him to a place of forgiveness. And I believe these are five steps that every one of us need to make, all of us can make, to find also that same forgiveness and freedom that he has. So let's just look at them together. First of all, the the number one step that David takes in order to find forgiveness for our horrendous sin that he has committed is a step of faith. You see, the first step that we have to take to receive forgiveness from God is a step of faith. Faith that he is a God who forgives. That he is a loving, gracious, kind, merciful God. And that's exactly what David says. He said, God, I don't understand it. If I were God, I probably wouldn't forgive me. But what I do know about you and what you have revealed about yourself to the world and what you and I know about God from the total experience of the Bible, he has revealed to us that he is a loving, merciful, gracious God. And we come to him in confident faith that he is a gracious, loving, merciful God. And we simply say, God, I come to you not based on who I am, but based on who you are. And I ask you to deal with me not based on who I am. I want you to deal with me based on who you are. God, I ask you to be merciful to me. You see, David was more concerned about mercy than anything else. He wasn't really at this moment worried about justice. Neither am I and neither are you. We don't need God's justice. We need God's mercy. I'm reminded of the story of a lady who had had a a, a daughter that had a wedding, and they took wedding pictures, and it's a big deal. And and so she was really aggravated with the photographer uh, with with the results of the pictures that were taken. And she was complaining and and fussing and, and just really wanting her money back. And it just became this huge deal. And finally, as she was going through pictures one by one by one to offer to the photographer the reason she hated all that he had done, she came to a picture of herself and the family, and she said to him, look, that picture does not do me justice. And he kind of smiled and said, ma'am, you don't need justice. You need mercy. (laughs) I want to tell you something. We don't need justice. We need mercy. And when David confronted the reality of his sin, when he looked at himself to say, you know what? I didn't even know I was capable of that. I find sometimes in my life, I end up doing things that I promised myself I would never do and others I would never do, things I would never dream I would do. And here I am. And he said, God, I just appeal to your mercy and I ask you to forgive me. And his appeal was to the nature of God. God, don't deal with me based on who I am. We know who I am. I ask you to deal with me based on who you are. I heard the story of two sisters who had gone to the ocean for the first time. The older sister and a younger sister were walking along the beach and they were fascinated by what they saw and they were there just as the sun began to set. And they watched in absolute wonder as the sun set on the horizon. And the older sister looked at the younger and she said, isn't that horizon just absolutely gorgeous? And the younger sister said, what's a horizon? And the older sister said, well, look out there. Do you see Do you see where the water reaches up to touch the sky and the sky reaches down to touch the water? That's the horizon. But you know what? If we go there, it won't be there. There'll be another one. And if we go there, it won't be there. There'll be another one and another one and another one. You can never really go to the horizon. And I want to tell you something. That's the way God's mercy is. 
It never ends. Just about the time you think what you have done will never garner the mercy and grace and forgiveness of God, we can be reminded that his mercy has no end. And there's not anything you could ever do that is not beyond his love and mercy and ability to forgive you and to restore you in right fellowship. God's mercy and love is like the horizon. There's always another one. And so David, first of all, comes to God and he says, God, I just appeal to you based on your mercy. You're a loving, merciful, gracious God. Be gracious to me based on who you are. But number two, he's honest. Did you notice that? David doesn't try to make excuses for what he has done. You know, a lot of the times when we come to God, we kind of offer all kinds of excuses as to why I did what I did. I'm justified in my action. Oh, I'm wrong and I shouldn't have done that, but I have good reasons for why I did. And I want to offer all of these reasons to God. David didn't do any of that. He doesn't blame other people for the problems that he has. He acknowledges, God, I'm the one. I messed up. Nobody else. This had nothing to do with Bathsheba. It has nothing to do with her husband. It has nothing to do with anybody but me. I'm the one that made the decision. I'm the one that must embrace the responsibility for what's happened. I'm the one. It's kind of like the old spiritual. It's me, it's me, it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Not my brother, not my sister, but it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. And David literally says, God, it's me. My dad used to tell me when I was a kid growing up, he said, listen, I want to tell you something. If you had the opportunity to kick the person most responsible for the problems you experience in life, you wouldn't be able to sit down for a week. We'd have to kick ourselves, wouldn't we? And that's what David is saying in the text before us. God, this is me. This is all me. I'm not trying to make excuse for it. In in fact, he does something very interesting. He, He takes responsibility for it. You can see the depth of it. In the words that he uses, he uses three words to describe what he did. He said, God, I I want you to to forgive me of my iniquity. Now, the word iniquity is an interesting word. It literally means to twist or pervert. God, I want you to forgive me for twisting and perverting your word. You are clear in your word when you said you shall not commit adultery. And you know what? I twisted that and I perverted that and I made excuses for that. And I I somehow believe that I'm not responsible. That doesn't apply to me. That doesn't mean anything. I twist and pervert the truth. We do that all the time today. We think we live in a in an enlightened age and the Bible is archaic and the Bible says all kinds of things that we are not to do and we should do, but we know better today. And we twist and we pervert the truth of God to say that under the circumstances of where we live and the times in which we live, it's okay. He said, God, forgive my iniquity. You you, you are clear. Your word is clear. But I twisted it. I perverted it. He also uses the word transgression. The word transgression means to trespass. If you've ever been on a hike in the woods or if you are a hunter, You've better ever been in the woods and you come to a fence and on that fence there's a sign that says posted, no trespassing, clearly marked, and you cross the fence anyway. That's what the word transgression means. It means I know that it is posted. I know I am not to go in there. I know that is off limits and I do it anyway. And he said, God, let me tell you, the, 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 the hideous nature of my sin is that I know better. Now, I don't know about you, but you know what I have to recognize? Most of the time when I sin, I, I, I know better too. God's clear. And there are times when I try to justify my action. There are times when I try to pervert the truth of God and say, well, I'm not sure he meant that, or did he meant that, mean that, or we're living in a new age and a new time, and that was applying to the people of the biblical time, but not to us, and, and we pervert and we twist, or we ultimately say this, I know God says this, but I choose to do it anyway. And he said, God, forgive me for my transgression. The third word that he uses to describe his sin is the word sin. He doesn't call it a mistake. He calls it sin. I've told you before, we don't like the word sin. That's just kind of a harsh word in our world today. We don't like the church because the church says we are sinners. We're not sinners. I mean, I'm not bad. I'm not a terrible, mean person. I make mistakes. I'm a mistaker, but I'm not a sinner. 
But David didn't come on the scene to say, God, I made a terrible mistake. I am a mistaker. Will you forgive me? He said, God, I have sinned. This is a sin. Sin literally means to miss the mark. It's the picture of a guy shooting an arrow with a bow at a target. And the target has concentric circles. In the middle is the bullseye, we call it. And he, and he is shooting for the bullseye. And he's missed it. Even if he misses it by a little bit, he still misses it. And so what David ultimately says is, God, when I reflect upon my life, look, I am guilty of iniquity. I've twisted and perverted the truth of your word. I willfully disobeyed you, and I missed the mark. I am not what I should be. I'm not the man I should have been. I'm not made the decision I should have made. I didn't do what I needed to have done. And then in his confession... He offers these three words, but he talks about these words. When he offers this confession, he said, my sin is ever before me. God, it never goes away. I feel horrible for what I've done. The guilt of what has happened haunts me daily. And then he says this, and this is an interesting phrase. Against you and you alone have I sinned. I want you to think about that for a minute. What about Bathsheba? I mean, you know the story. He called her in. How does she say no to a king in the kingdom? What about the child that was born to them that died? What about that? But he doesn't say, I've sinned against Bathsheba. I've sinned against her husband, Uriah, whom I, who, I took advantage of his wife, and then I had him killed. He said, I've sinned against you, God, and only you. Why in the world would he say that? except for the fact that every obligation that we have to other people is a result of God's law. The reason I'm to treat you the way I'm to treat you is because of God's standard and law. And that means that I cannot do anything against you that is not against God. God is the one who established the standard. And so to sin against you is to sin against God. And he said it's all the same. I've sinned against God. God, you are the one that established the standard. Had I walked in your standard, I would have never harmed the people around me. It is you, God, that I have sinned against. And then he finally says this of that experience. I was shaped in sin in my mother's womb. God, I have a sinful nature. Now, this is what he was saying ultimately. I don't need forgiveness just because of the things I've done. I need forgiveness because of who I am. God, this thing's deeper than just what I've done. This isn't just about making a mistake that I can, I, I can repay someone and get it over with. God, it's much, much <clears throat> deeper than that. I am a sinner by nature. And there's not anything I can do about this sinful nature. I was born in sin. Do you understand that children are born to sinful parents, born in sin? Now, the Bible tells us God does not hold children accountable. We believe and interpret the scriptures to say that there's an age of accountability. God does not hold a child accountable for their sin until they're old enough to discern between right and wrong. But you don't have to teach a child to sin. They just, it's, boy, listen, this is what I've discovered. I've got three grandchildren. And, and the youngest one's just about one, and, and, or he's a little over one, just kind of toddling around now. And he can take something away from his sister right now, and you can ask him the question, Levi, did you take that away from your sister? And he'll shake his head. Mm -mm. He can't even talk. You know what I've discovered? We have to teach him to talk, but we don't have to teach him to lie. You don't have to teach a child how to lie. They know how to do that. There is something in our nature that is sinful. And David looks back upon his life and he said, God, I've been a sinner since I was born. There's nothing I can do about my sin. And as a result of, of being born in sin, I, I, I have a propensity toward twisting the truth and perverting your word and, and doing what you tell me not to do, God. I don't need you to just forgive me for what I've done. I need you to do something much deeper than that. I need you to forgive me. I'm a sinner. I am a sinner separated from you. God, don't just 
forgive me for what I've done, but for what I am. And because he has this desire, he does the third thing that is the third step to forgiveness. He prays. This is a part of the prayer. He's confessing his sin. And you know what the Bible says in the New Testament? If you confess your sin, God is faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. The word confess means to agree with. It means, God, you're right. I'm a sinner. And I accept the reality that I'm a sinner. And because of that, I ask you to forgive me of my sin. So here is David, honest about his sinful condition recognizes that God is a merciful, gracious God, but he doesn't just sit there saying, man, I wish God would forgive me. I want God to forgive me. He wants it enough to ask. Every one of us in this room wish that God would forgive us of our sin. And all you have to do is ask. All you have to do is come to him. You'll never know God's forgiveness if you don't ask for it. And so what does David do? I don't just want his forgiveness. I'm asking. And so he comes and he prays. And he doesn't just desire it. He asked for it. And this is what he said, God, purge me of my sin. The word purge that he uses there means to get it out. Now, if you're from Louisiana, you know exactly what that means. Because we love to eat crawfish in Louisiana. And we purge them before. And for those of you in Texas, you don't know what we're talking about. You just buy the bags of crawfish. They're still alive. And you take a big old number three wash tub and you fill it up. Just makes my mouth water when I talk about it. You fill that old number three wash tub up with water and you put salt in it because crawfish are not salt water animals. You put them in that salt water and it just cleanses it, purges them, makes them spit out all that bad stuff that's in there so that when you suck that head, none of that other gritty stuff's in there. I thought you'd like that anyway. Oh, by the way, I, I saw on Facebook this morning that there's a major problem, I think, in Minnesota right now. They found crawfish in the lakes in Minnesota. And they are absolutely worried to death. It is an invasive species, they say, and they're trying to figure out what to do with it. Listen, just offer discount flights from Louisiana to Minnesota, and you won't have to worry about it. And I tell you, I read a statistic. I know I'm chasing a rabbit. I'm sorry, but rabbits always come back, so we'll be back in just a second. Um, I read an article one time that says Louisiana produces 98% of all crawfish consumed in America. And Louisiana consumes 95% of all that are consumed in America. If they could ever figure out how to get it outside of the state, it would be a wealthy state. But they just eat it all right there. Purge literally means to get it out. And this is what David is saying. God, I want this out. I don't want to carry this with me. I've been carrying this thing around with me and it is drowning me. It is killing me. It has consumed my thoughts. Purge me. Get this out of me, God. Please forgive me in such a way that you just get it all out. He continues and uses even other terms. Wash me. That's the, the, the term that we get laundry from. Literally, wash me. I feel dirty. Wash me. And then the next word he uses is an interesting. It means, he said, blot out my sin. That literally means to wipe it away so there's no trace of it. It was a term that was used to describe what happened when a person was writing. Back in Jesus' day, there was papyrus reeds that they would beat together to make a paper or parchment that they would, or, or papyrus that they would write on. And, uh, and the ink that they used then does not have acid in it like the ink that we use right now that allows it to kind of bite into the fiber of the paper. And as a result of that, it had to dry. But even after it's dried, you have to be careful with it because you can just literally take a, a, a wet sponge and wipe it off and that's what it means i want you to wipe it off i want no evidence of this sin in my life and you know that's what the bible says god promises to do don't you love that old testament verse that tells us though our sins be scarlet they can be made as white as snow god can take the sin that you have committed and he can remove it completely now the fourth thing that he does is this he says, God, I believe you will forgive and can. And because I believe you can and will, I'm confessing to you that I'm a sinner. I've messed up. I'm, I'm, I'm not blaming anybody else. I'm honest about my sin. And now I, I pray and I ask you, God, to forgive me. Cleanse me. And then the fourth thing he does is repents. 
he turns from his sin to serve. He turns from his sin to serve. He ultimately says in the text before us, then I will declare your praises. God, when you begin to purge me, I'm going to tell everybody what you've done for me. You see, when you are cleansed and forgiven, you are grateful, and grateful people want to serve. Grateful people want to tell and do things for the ones who have done for them. And he says, God, as you forgive me, I'm going to tell everybody of your greatness. If you can forgive me, God, you can forgive anybody. God, if you can make my life okay after all I go through, you can make anybody's life okay. And I'm going to live my life proclaiming the reality of that truth. Repent means to turn from my sin to God. It means, God, I've done this, and I ask you to forgive me, and I'm not going to do it again. By your grace, by your power, by your strength, I'm going to turn from that life that I was living, and I'm going to turn to you. The word repentance means a bowed face. It's a military term that means to change direction. When Jesus confronted the woman that had been caught in the act of adultery and the religious leaders brought her to Jesus in an effort to condemn her, and they said, here is a woman that was caught in the act of adultery, the very act. They had staged the whole thing, set it up, was, had a trap for her, and then they caught her, and they brought her to Jesus, and they said, you know, we are to, our law says we are to stone her to death. What do you say, Jesus? And you remember what Jesus said? He who is without sin cast the first stone. And the Bible said slowly they they began to drop their stones and walk away. And then Jesus, after everybody had left, he looked at the woman and he says, Hey, where are those who condemn you? And she she, she raised up and looked around. She said, They're gone. He said, Then neither do I condemn you. Neither do I condemn you. But then he said this, very interesting. Go and sin no more. There's forgiveness, but don't go back to the way you were living. Don't, don't go back and, and do the same stuff you're doing. Don't make the same decisions you've made in the past. Turn from that and you will find forgiveness. I don't condemn you. Repent is the fourth step. The fifth one. I, I use the word sincerity. I, I, I don't know that there's another word that could capture it. It really is an attitude of the other four steps, I guess. The one thing that I see in David that I often fail to see in my own heart and in the hearts of others is that David was not only sorry for what he had done, he was broken about it. And he didn't try to offer God some kind of payment. In fact, he even says, God, you're not interested in sacrifices or I could give it. Man, I've got cattle everywhere. If you wanted a sacrifice, I've got sheep. Man, we could give you three or four hundred of them. But what I really understand, God, is you're not interested in sacrifice. I can't buy you off. You want my heart. And the sacrifice that you're interested in, God, is a broken and a contrite heart. And you won't reject that. So when I come to you asking God, recognizing that you are a loving, merciful God, I don't understand that truly, but I believe that you are a merciful God. And I take ownership of the sin that I've committed and the things that I've done. And I turn from that, God, and, and, and I pray and ask you to forgive me of my sin. And I do that, God, in all brokenness. You see, there's a difference between repentance and remorse. If I can give you a story, there are two characters at the end of Jesus' life that give us a real good picture of this. One of them is Peter and the other is Judas. Both sinned, right? Both of them. Both of them turned their back on Jesus at a critical time. Peter denied Jesus three times. Judas sells him out. Peter repents after the rooster crowed the third time he weeps in bitterness to say I can't believe I did that I never dreamed I would ever do that that's not what I wanted oh I did it nobody else did it I can't blame anybody else it's me and he wept bitterly over the fact that 
and his relationship with Christ and severed. What does Judas do? Judas sins and he betrays Christ and then he goes out and hangs himself. And it shows us the picture of repentance and remorse. Let me tell you what, repentance is concerned about the relationship. Remorse is concerned about the consequences. Peter wasn't concerned about the consequences. He was broken because my relationship with God is gone. And I wonder if I could ever get that back. Will he ever forgive me? Will I ever be able to tell him I'm sorry? Will he ever understand? Will it ever be what it once was? His greatest worry was the relationship. He didn't care about the consequences. In fact, Peter would have said, God, you can double the consequences. I don't care the consequences. I'm worried about the relationship. Let the consequences be whatever they have to be to fix the relationship. I want to fix the relationship. But if you're remorse over what you've done, all you're worried about is the consequences. I want God to forgive me so I don't suffer the consequences. A broken and a contrite heart says, God, I want you to forgive me because I want to be restored in right fellowship with you. The basis for forgiveness that we experience today is in Jesus. The Bible tells us that Jesus died on the cross. Here's the story. God came from heaven to earth in the person of Jesus and died on the cross to pay for your sins. He took the first step. You have to take the next one. But here's the good news. You are right now five steps away from forgiveness you're just five steps away five steps away of letting go of all this junk you've been holding on to for years five steps away from having a vibrant relationship with God when you take the first step of faith God I believe your loving gracious merciful God you came to earth and died on the cross. I don't understand it, but I believe it. I am a sinner. And I'm going to be honest about that. I'm not going to pretend. I'm not going to make any excuses for it. I'm not blaming anybody else. I'm a sinner, and you shouldn't love me, and you shouldn't be merciful to me. But I'm going to be honest with you today. And as a result of that, God, I'm going to ask you to forgive me of my sin. I'm going to pray and ask you, God, to forgive me and, and to come into my life. And I'm going to turn from my sin with your power and with your strength and with your grace. I'm going to turn from that and I'm going to, I, I'm, I'm going to live a life of gratitude for you. God, I'm not worried about the consequences. I just want to be restored in right fellowship with you. And so whatever it takes to do that, do that. And you take that fifth step. And you're going to walk right back into the presence of God. Or, for the first time, you will walk into the presence of God. And you can do it right now. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the truth of your word. Thank you that David was so honest and transparent that he's willing to write this stuff down. Much of this we would never have known. These are his personal struggles. And yet he wrote it out so that we could see that, like him, we desperately need to take this same step of faith. And there are many in this room that have thought about taking that step of faith, and I pray that today they would take it. It may be that they're already honest about the fact that they are a sinner. They get that. But the tough step for them is this step of faith, and I pray they'll take that first step. And then the next of honesty and the next they'll just open their mouth and heart in prayer ask you for forgiveness, to repent of their sin, and to receive the eternal life that you have for them. May it happen today. We're just five steps away, God. I pray that you will not allow us to step off into eternity until we've taken these five steps, and we'll do that today. In Jesus' name, amen. If you're here and want to take that first step, I want to give you an opportunity to do that. And um, I'm going to stand here at the front and 
And all you got to do in a moment is just stand up and take the first step. That first step is the faith step. And, and then to come forward and say, God, hey, I know I'm a sinner. That's an easy one. And I'm going to ask God to forgive me. And I'm going to give him my life. Or maybe even as a believer, you're here and, and you're struggling. You know you're saved, but you're still listening to the voice that says God will not forgive you for whatever it is that you've done. And you can come today and take that same first step of faith to say, no, I'm not listening to that anymore. I'm confessing that and God's going to forgive. And as I turn from it, give